Hello, and welcome to our presentation for creating a happy transition to a senior care community. Allow me to ask you a few questions and see if any of these resonate with you. Are you a caregiver at your wits end? Are you burning the candle at both ends trying to take care of your personal life and a loved one? Are you at the point where you think you are beyond your skills and needing some professional care for your loved one? Are you concerned about picking the right care community once you're ready for that point? Do you know the key factors in creating a happy transition? These are just a few of the situations that I come across and I want to share with you today. I'm here with Pam Ostrowski, the certified dementia care expert and the author of It's Not That Simple, Helping Families Navigate the Alzheimer's Journey to talk candidly about when and how to make a happy transition to the higher level of care and skilled expertise. Feel free to chat any questions in the chat box. We wanna have a conversation with you and be able to help you as much as we possibly can. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you will receive an email back with a recording along with the seven tips to creating a happy transition to a senior care community. Without further ado, our guest today is Pam Ostrowski. She's an expert in Alzheimer's caregiving guidance. Family members work with Pam one-on-one, -on -one, working through solutions to a myriad of challenges and emotions family members face during the various transitions they undergo on the dementia and Alzheimer's journey. Her book is based on her 14-year Alzheimer's journey with her mother and her Alzheimer's family consulting services she provides nationwide. Pam is also a certified dementia practitioner and is a cert certified in dementia care. So if you have questions, we have got the right person for you. If the time comes, when the time comes, and you're thinking of moving to a higher level of care for your loved one, we hope that you will think of me, visit me. I'm Lori Marsh. I'm the marketing director at the summit at Sunland Springs in Mesa, Arizona. And I like to think that the summit is assisted living and memory care, but it's like a docked cruise ship. We want you to be able to enjoy your life and the finer things that you can have. So without further ado, let's dive into today's topic. I'm pretty sure that some of our viewers are out there saying there is no happy transition to a senior care community. Pam, what do you think happy really means? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Lori, first of all, for inviting me. I appreciate it. And when we think about the happy transition, I think we, as I remember back in my journey, and I thought, you know, that there's no way that, that this is going to be a happy experience because my mom had already had issues with vocalization. Mm -hmm. and, and so your heart's heavy. And then you're considering this move and moves are always a bit dramatic and traumatic. And so what I, I, I thought back when I wrote the book and, and as I've worked with other family members and we, as we've talked, uh, that there's really a family member tends to superimpose their viewpoint of who that person was five or 10 mm -hmm. years ago. And, and what happens is they treat them the same way and they don't want to open the lens right. to actually see who that person is and where they're at. Right. And dementia and Alzheimer's are totally different than any medical disease. As you know, some people know that, but most family members mm -hmm. don't. They, they want to have the loved one with them. So we're gonna talk a bit about that mm -hmm. as well. But one of the biggest things for a happy transition is preparation. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that a couple of webinars ago. So if you've missed that, presentation and you want to make sure that you have the right transition information and the conversation starters and that type of thing, um, you can do that through um, YouTube. You can either look for the Summit at Sunland Springs mm -hmm. on YouTube or it's not that simple um, and that or, or uh, Alzheimer's Family Consulting. So you can find that information there. Uh, but again, preparation is so important. And so when I think back to my mom and the, the conversations I've had with my friend's parents, um, they say, I never wanted to be a burden to my right. child. Right. Right. How Nobody often, wants to be a burden. Exactly. And you hear that all the time. And yet there's the sense of guilt and the sense of having a perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, 
and that this person needs you and that you don't want to let them go. Right. And so as a result, you try to be a caregiver. Mm -hmm. And the caregiver policies, procedures that happen in a care community are certified. You're looking at people who know what they're doing. They're skilled. They're trained. Right. And you as a family member are not. Are not. I mean, the, the number of myths I hear from family members about dementia care um, are scary. They alarm mm -hmm. me. But one of the challenges then is, is that you're, you're underestimating this person's needs. And that becomes a problem. So really that happy transition is about one where there's preparation, acceptance, mm -hmm. right, with dignity and respect so that you can go into this saying, okay, we've made this decision. We need to figure out what are next steps and explore that. Right. And so to me, that's, that's what I, I see that contrast between caregiver, family member mentality, um, and a, maybe a lack of preparation. And then there's that fear. Mm -hmm. So emotions drive behaviors, right? Yeah. And so guilt and fear and we then end up in a situation where nobody wants to talk about it. I'll just keep my loved one at home a few more months. And that's the worst thing right. you can do. And we'll talk about that. Yes. Yeah. So, so what today I hope that we do is, is let's take those beliefs and put them in a box just for today. If we could do it for longer, it would be good. Uh, <laughs> but let's open our minds to the possibilities of improved relationships because your relationship can really suffer in this. If you're a, if you're a child, your mother and father never wanted you mm -hmm. to clean them up in the bathroom mm -hmm. or clean them up in their bedroom because they didn't know where the bathroom was. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want any of that. Uh, so improved relationships, improved behaviors, uh, because in a care community, there's a lot more space to move around, a lot more activities, so more stimulation and engagement. Uh, cleanliness is also really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then. Fun. I mean, you know, the summit at Sunland right. Springs, you know, we still haven't played pool yet. So <laughs> I'm just saying that there's a pool game of, that's got to happen before the end of, uh, before the end of uh, too, too many more of these presentations. Sounds we'll good. let you know how it turns out. Sounds good. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I end up having families come to me in two different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Number one, they're either in crisis mode or they're coming in with some time on their side and able to plan. Crisis mode is either on the assisted living side, maybe mom has fallen, broken something, gone to rehab, and now she can't go home. Or if it's a memory care situation, they have been at home with the loved one, the adult child. Mm -hmm. the, the family is at their wit's end. The relationship between that husband and wife is suffering. And now, you know, they're now at the point saying, we just cannot continue to care for this person. Right. And I see, I see this every day of why would you stretch yourself so far and, and destroy the rest of your quality of life because you think you need to care. You have this responsibility to care. There is so much more to Alzheimer's and, um, dementia than just losing your mind. There's a lot that is happening inside their body that unfortunately is different in every single person. So when we come here, um, I, I try to guide families when they come through that there's two different sides. There's a psychological side of a transition and a physical side of the transition. And you're going to definitely speak to the psychological side of getting the caregiver, the loved one on, uh, caregiver on board, the adult child on board, because it's really so much of their burden that they're trying to get over in their own yes. head. And then we'll cover some of the physical side of what it's actually like to be able to move somebody in mm -hmm. smoothly. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. uh, when we look at that, the mindset of what do you think is true about, um, how different families are coming in here? Well, so when we look at the crisis calls, which outweigh the, um, the people who are prepared, right, right it's, it really does come down to mindset mm -hmm. and where your head is at. So, and what stories you tell yourself, because the stories that most, I hear most families telling themselves is, mom said never to put me in a home. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh my gosh, a, um, a home is a place where there's a bunch of smelly old people right. and they have this really archaic 40-year-old 
um, viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And it's horrible. And it's like, well, I wouldn't put my parent in that either. However, if we can think about this from the perspective of, first of all, ask yourself the question, what is it you believe? And is what you believe absolutely true? And that's going to set the tone for all the rest of the conversations. If you're not making the inevitable move be a horrible thing, then nobody else in the family really is going to be picking up on right. it being. Right. If you're making it be like, there's going to come a time when the care is going to be beyond what I know how to care for, Mom, mm -hmm. and, and you're going to be beyond what I can really do, mm -hmm. then we're going to have to be going to this next step, mm -hmm. kind of setting that framework. Right. So so the 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 real challenge comes into, and you, you alluded to this, is... As family members, and, and this is no fault of anyone's, and I understand that it comes from the heart, I should take care of mom because she took care of me. That is, first of all, incorrect thinking, bad story to tell yourself because your mom never wanted her daughter to pick up after her. I hear that all the time. And, and it's like, no, 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 back up. Mm -hmm. And so one of the points about being prepared is that if you'd have this conversation further in advance, your mother will get to tell you, I never want you wiping my butt. Right. You know, right. and I never want you to be showering me. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for those husbands and, and wives out there who have loved ones with dementia or, or mild cognitive mm -hmm. impairment, um, they don't want you doing that either. No. That was not part of the vows. So we, we, we as humans feel like we're obligated. And with that obligation also comes uh, sadness, potential resentment. Like, I can't believe you just did this. Mm. And, and that was not the way this was, that's not the way a human wants to be treated. Mm -hmm. So it is your responsibility as a loved one to get the right care, to get the best care mm -hmm. you possibly can, to, to migrate this individual into that care sooner than later so that you aren't responsible for their disorientation and their being unsettled. And the later that you wait, the more difficult the transition is. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm not saying that, and we'll talk about the care continuum in just a second, but it really is important to understand that where your responsibility lies is in the best care possible for your loved one. And that you being a caregiver, I hate to break it to you, is most likely the worst thing you can do for a loved one with dementia, mid-stage dementia and Alzheimer's. If you want them to stay home, know that you're giving up your job because they need 24 seven mm -hmm. eyes on care. That doesn't mean put them in front of the TV while right. you're washing dishes right. because there's no stimulation there. You're not helping them at all. And, and ultimately it is a huge stressor because by the way, your spouse is not gonna get your attention. Mm -mm. Your kids are not gonna get the attention. How good at nutrition? Are you a nutritionist? I know one of our criteria when we, when mom and dad and I looked and with my brother and his wife, you know, nutritionist was on mm -hmm. my list. It's mm -hmm. like, I want somebody who understands most families, Doritos and fried chicken and pizza and, oh, mom can have pizza or, mm -hmm. you know, burritos or whatever. And, and you just eat what we eat. And, and that's not good for someone who has um, brain, dis, you know, impairment. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's also an impairment from the perspective that when you think about dementia and Alzheimer's, so dementia is actually a condition. It's not a disease. So it's a condition where it's characterized by two brain functions or more actually suffering from impairment. And, and with Alzheimer's, that is a disease. And that is the reason why it's a disease is because brain cells are dying. Amyloid plaques and tau proteins are increasing in the brain. The brain is shrinking. There's holes in the brain. Um, you know, it, it's not a pretty picture. But when you look at that whole picture overall of what's happening, mm -hmm. what family member understands what's going on there? Right. And, and how do you care for that individual when something that complicated is happening up here? So, um, you know, let's talk a bit about the care continuum. Yes. Um, so, you know, one of the things that is important to note is that you, yes, in-home care, everybody says, oh, well, we're just going to do in-home care. Yeah. But my question to you is, did you ask the in-home care service, what type of dementia training does this individual have? Or have the, how often... You know, what type of um, activities do they have planned for my loved one? Most of the time, it's just a babysitter, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's if you're just looking for someone to do housekeeping and maybe do some like cooking or or, you know, um, keep your loved one company. 
keeping that person company is a, a loose term because I that's not valuable to someone with de- uh, mid-stage dementia. If you're offering, wanting to offer stimulation to them. Exactly. So okay. find out if you're going to do that. Then you move on to assisted living. And assisted living, well, actually, I would say independent living. So that's what my dad did. He was on independent mamas and assisted. Same apartment, two-bedroom apartment. Mm-hmm. Place was great. And and she got more attention. She improved. And he was happy. And so that was great. And then she moved from assisted to memory. And dad needed some help with his medications. So we add on those different services. We move them up a floor, exact same apartment, exact same layout. Went to lunch, came back, went up a floor higher, never knew the difference. Mm-hmm. So, and then, um, and then you've got, after that, memory care, which is where we ended up with mom. And then after that, uh, or in, in addition to, or a derivation of, is the skilled nursing home. That is typically for medical issues. Right. Higher medical needs that exactly. need that hands-on nurse care, IV drips, those specific medical Care. Yeah. And before we get too far, I, I do want to just touch base in this when we're talking about the different places that can be care communities. Mm-hmm. In home care, you're usually paying by the hour um, and you have a contracted amount of time. $35 an hour is not an unheard of um, amount based on what's, what skill set you need. And location. In the and country. location, exactly. Um, if you are coming into an assisted living community, Again, there's lots of different levels. You can come in as an independent. You can come in in needing maybe some medication management, or maybe you're needing some extra eyes on when someone's in the shower. But it, if the sooner that you start the conversation, and even if someone's coming in as independent, they're becoming familiar. They're realizing the value that another environment is really bringing to you, and that's part of the the transition is getting rid of the misconceptions that I'm going to be happier at my home or I want to be independent at my home. And at a care community, they are built and and put together to care for individuals that have some need. They have activities. They have social events. Mm -hmm. They are in environment, holidays, holidays, and they're an environment of your peers. Mm -hmm. They're able to have a conversation, reminisce, share similar life um, experiences, and it not be you were my mom and the daughter, and now the daughter is in charge of what the mom once was. I mean, that power dynamic in a family is is just volatile. Absolutely. Okay, I got you off topic. Well, no, no, but I, I wanted to add to that a bit because to your point, Dad never had any friends. He and mom lived in their little patio home and uh, they went to the mall together and they went to the grocery store together and they just hopped around the world together and they had no friends really. So then they moved to the care community and dad made friends with a a gentleman who is his age and they talked about baseball. Mm -hmm. And so the the one gentleman had a computer, dad did not. So he would print off the baseball scores like you wouldn't watch that on TV, but never mind. Uh, They they had that little thing and then he would find jokes about baseball or something about Babe Ruth, you know, and they would... Uh, they would share their jokes and they all, the four of them would sit down and have lunch and dinner together. And, and they had someone to communicate with and to enjoy those shared memories, right. as you said. And the, changing that power dynamic within a family can be very detrimental to the relationship. And by the way, if you have siblings and all of a sudden you're the one who's taking care mm-hmm. of your loved one, your, your mom or dad, those siblings can really wreak havoc. Like you're not doing it right. So you get, so you put yourself in a position of criticism from the siblings and then they are like, oh, I'm busy that weekend. You can't have that weekend off because I've got to go do this. Right. So there's, it, it, it basically, to me, care communities level the playing field so that everybody mm. gets to play at whatever level they want uh, and that there's more engagement. Like I said, mom did better in a care community than she did at home. That so. is a good way of looking at it, leveling the playing field so that everybody can come together with the amount of time they have. And the burden is not sitting on one sibling mm-hmm. to carry the load because then that perpetuates another generation of, I took care of mom all the way to the end. Yes. And what did you do? Right. Right. And then there's that animosity. So when they do pass, then you've got the financial. Well, I spent all my life doing that. Yeah. So it's just, 
it breeds so much animosity right? within the family. And what, to your point about finances, mm -hmm. um, I was talking to one care community, or not care community, but uh, in home service. And she said, well, uh, for seven by 24 services, it's $100,000 for one caregiver. If the individual needs to be lifted, like a large gentleman or a large uh, female, uh, or needs specific care for lifting and moving, right. $200,000 a year. And I can promise you that that is nowhere near what you will find in the care communities. Right, right. So it's also a cost savings, which I don't think that most children who haven't actually gone out and toured and found out more mm -hmm. information and you know, like meeting with someone like mm -hmm. you, they don't understand what the cost, they think it's easier just to bring somebody in and it's cheaper. And it's like, yeah, no, it's no, not. It's not, not for dementia and Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. definitely not. Okay, so well, that was see. fun, but that had nothing to do with what we were <laughs> that we have here. <laughs> All right, so many family members, um, when they are getting to the point of actually moving into a place, they are confused with how to respond when someone says, "I want to go home." Yeah, um, and I then I get questions about what what should you be bringing. So let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how someone, a family member could handle those kind of questions. And then we'll talk about what to be bringing when you're coming into a care community. Right. I think these are, are two questions that I hear quite frequently mm -hmm. as obstacles. Like, I don't know the answers to all of these questions. Right. So I'm just going to bury my head in the sand and we'll just ignore them. Right. And the bottom line is the more you know, the more prepared you are, the easier this whole thing goes when it happens. I mean, we're not saying go out there and move today. What we're saying is this is a process and we're trying to educate you now mm -hmm. so that you can start the process so that when you are ready, and by the way, wait lists, just right. two words, right. right? Most memory care communities right now, especially have wait lists. Right. Especially so, coming off of COVID, mm -hmm. where people kept them at home and then now things are starting to just crack and mm -hmm. it's realizing that there, there's additional care that you can't do at home. Yeah. Um, which is, which is, you know, you've got to prepare for that. Yeah. So, so back to the home question, when your loved one says, I want to go home, let's think about what home mm -hmm. is. I think most people think of it as, well, I got to have a driveway and a two car garage and it has a living room, three bedrooms and two baths. No, that's a building. And your loved one is not saying, I want to go back to that building. I'm, they're not even saying that they want to go back to the furniture or the tchotchkes and the pictures and everything. Home is a feeling that comes from the heart. And they're basically panicking because they don't remember who they are. They don't mm -hmm. remember necessarily their family and friends. Mm -hmm. So they, home was all of these wonderful people as part of your life. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just slipping away. I mean, and, and they're, you know, it's literally like trying to grasp mm -hmm. a rope going, why do I, you look familiar, but I don't know why. And right. why, that's one of the reasons why introducing yourself with your name and your relationship to them is so important as dementia per, and, or Alzheimer's progresses. So to me, we, again, superimpose our 10 year, five years ago impression of who this person was. And when they say, I want to go home, we think physical place. Mm -hmm. That's not what's going through their head. So again, the advice to always meet them where they're at and not where you're at is so important and so critical. Mm -hmm. So so from, from my perspective, um, that's a, a really important aspect. Um, so there's a couple ways to get them off of that topic uh -huh. because I know that they'll ask it every five minutes. And so the, the one is to say, well, what was your favorite memory of home? Right. You know, what did you like about home? And, and they might say, well, I like the hamburgers. I mean, mm -hmm. it might surprise, it's uh, guaranteed right. actually, it will surprise, surprise you, you what, comes out, what comes out of their mouths about what they liked about home. Now we're going to talk about redirection because that's one of yours and my right. favorite conversations is you can say, well, things change. Uh, but you know what, why don't we go play a game or why don't we go listen to music? So that redirect and trust me with mid-stage dementia and, and late stage and same is true with, with Alzheimer's. So we separate those two because there's 70 different types of dementia um, that we're able to get them to go, oh, look, shiny thing, you know, and, you know, we always joke about the shiny object, right? But um, that really is what you're doing. And, and, the difference is, is that at the average family member does not know how to redirect. My girlfriend back east, she asked, her mother asked her the same question every probably five minutes and she keeps answering. I said, why are you doing that? Why aren't you doing something else with her? Why aren't you playing music or bringing out the photo album or doing something else? Family members don't understand how to redirect 
And care communities have professional caregivers, skilled activities directors that are trained on how do you redirect. Right. So I imagine you have an example I or do. two of that. Sure. I mean, the one thing also that you can think about when you have a care community versus your home, we have more places to go. So if you Good are point. just locked in your four walls, especially in this past year, um, there's not a lot of other places to go. And the constant questions of the same question really can start to aggravate Everyone. Get on the best of somebody's <laughs> nerves. So one thing that we do is as trained, skilled caregivers, um, we know how to be able to make alternative suggestions. We are able to go and offer, let's go and do this activity. Mm -hmm. Let's go listen to this music. We have some fantastic games that the residents get to be engaged in. And so whether it be walking out in the courtyard and looking at the flowers or being able to enjoy some other um, experiences or even have another conversation with someone, we know how to handle those kind of questions and we don't wear tire of them because that is what we are trained in. Right. So I think that that's a big piece to be able to understand that there's a lot more that's happening in a dementia, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline world that has training behind it. And that's right. what we are prepared for. If it's in an assisted living um, area, there are a number of people that have some mild cognitive decline that live in the assisted living side. They're not a risk for um, wandering or being able to um, they still can direct some of their day. They just need an extra pair of eyes. And so it's that environment that continues to keep them engaged. When you have the social activities, when you have the peer in involvement, and then you have trained caregivers, that's a big difference between being at home and, and helping understand that that's what you're going to get out of right. a transition into a care community. Right. So one of my favorite things, um, you know, we talk about the move and, and what that's going to look like in their room mm -hmm. and what do you bring? Right. And so with mom, I mean, in, in her situation, you know, you basically are paring things down at each move and, but her big thing, and she, I think she moved right near one of the holidays and I just plastered for Valentine's day. I got all those sticky hearts mm -hmm. and I put them all over her room and I had this big fluffy furry heart on her door. And, and she knew it was, so, so there's two things. She knew it was Valentine's day. She knew it was love, mm -hmm. right? So they're still in there. That's the other thing that I want to emphasize is that they're still in there. They're still aware of things. It's just a matter of what degree and the fact that they can't communicate it. Mom mm -hmm. was non-vocal for seven years, mm -hmm. but I knew she was in there almost to the very end. And just because I got in trouble a few times and I got my knee tapped. Uh, so, but, but if you can decorate the room for seasonal things like Easter, uh, Christmas, you know, whatever holidays you celebrate, mm -hmm. basically, but any, every month I did something different. And, um, and make the warm, you know, make it the room warm with, um, not temperature wise, but, um, although that's not a bad idea, uh, but quilts and things with texture, teddy bears, you know, soft things that, that they can touch. Um, and then for mom, I had this, uh, I had this boom box. I should go this way because it wasn't that big. It wasn't like the kind of carry on your shoulder. Um, and I made a custom CD with all of her favorite music and they would turn it down really lowly and they would tuck her in at night and give her a kiss and and then they have her listen to her music and i think honestly i think another fear point that we haven't really covered mm -hmm. is love you, we talked about this before this presentation is loving on them mm -hmm. you know these individuals these caregivers and the activities directors and the people in the care community they're only with your loved one for about eight hours, eight to 12 hours. They're, they don't have to deal with everything that right. you as a family member have to deal with nonstop seven by 24 where it starts to really wear you out so they're, they come in with a fresh face, they're, they pat their hand and they give them a kiss. And, you know, sometimes I was getting jealous because I knew that mom had, was flirting with one of the care, male caregivers and he adored her and she would just smile for him and raise her eyebrows and, and it was fun and she had fun. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder, are we being selfish? Mm. Coming As right back to that. Family member, am I being selfish? What if the best thing that I could possibly do mm -hmm. is to let her go, let, let go of that control, 
uh, <laughs> because it's really hard. You love this person and they're like a fragile egg and you don't want to give your egg over to somebody mm -hmm. who's a stranger. And to be able to realize this is a skilled stranger that can actually do better for your parent uh, in this case uh, than, than you can and that you can now reclaim your role as a daughter or a son or a spouse. And that doesn't give you permission to be a helicopter person, a helicopter child or, or spouse, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So what recommendations do you have about what to bring yeah. uh, when, when someone moves? I think those are such, such good points. Well, we did want to make this a little bit of fun. So I do have my top tips on what to pack and what to leave behind when moving a loved one into memory care. So... Number one, top tip, the 10 or 15 outfits that you're going to bring for the resident. Um, make sure that maybe their waistbands have drawstring or good elastic. Great point. Forgot as, about that one. <laughs> uh, as they are, maybe as the degree, degree disease might be progressing, they might experience some weight loss. Um, and you need to be able to have some some clothing that can adjust with their size and dropping pants is n never a good thing. But they also weight gain because of nutrition. That's what happened to mom. Right. She actually gained 10 pounds because she wasn't eating White Castle burgers and French fries. Right. She was eating salads and things that were good for her and some good um, clean protein. So, yes. you know, that's, that's the other yes. way is that that could be a good thing. No matter what, label everything, all clothes, all personal items. Socks. It, socks. <laughs> um, so you can either do that with labels that they make that you can iron in. You could do it with a Sharpie marker. But the important thing to realize is a memory care community is a communal environment, similar to a dorm environment. And so items get dropped along the way, um, whether it be a slipper or a hat. Um, and so you really can't be too uh, possessive about what they might go into a community with because the important thing is we do try to keep their items with them, but they get lost along the path. Um, we also want to make sure that nothing of too much value is being brought into the community. Though everybody has their own room and their own um, secure door, items can get picked up by one person and brought to another person. And we would hate to have the most valuable item in your family suddenly be lost. You certainly can find, uh, you could take a picture of something, you could put it in a photo album, maybe you can find um, a replica, but just realize that is a communal environment. Um, another thing, keep the Medicare ID cards, the, the personal <laughs> information, um, money at home. Your, your loved one does not need their Medicare card with us in a memory care community or their ID. We really want to limit the amount of personal identifying information from being at the community. Again, a purse, a wallet is something that people have, uh, are very familiar to them. And that, that uh, our ladies walk around with their purse and they have a lipstick in it and they have a wallet in it, and you could put old Blockbuster cards in it or just old... Monopoly some, money. Yeah, Monopoly money. Something in it so that they feel like they, this is their personal information, but none of that per real identifying information should come into a community that way. Everything that we need is on file. We've, we've taken information from it before. Um, and then as far as what items to bring into a community, usually a bed a nightstand, a chair, um, are all comfortable items to be able to bring in. We really try to limit TVs coming in because again, in our <laughs> environment, we want them to come out and be social and participate in and, and visit and be in the living room space, use the, the room and the bathroom um, where they rest at night or where they rest, but be able to be out and engaged. And then everybody also has another pair of eyes on them. So yes, if that's you turn, so important. If you just give them that TV and they think, oh, I have to have that TV, um, just try it. Try it for a little bit if that TV right. wasn't there right. and see how they do. And so the way to handle that is to say, oh, we left it at home. Now, if they have even early onset, of uh, or early dementia or mid-stage dementia, they, they may ask the question again, but you can forget it every time. Right. So it's not a problem to say that, that you forgot it at home, because to me, 
I, if I owned a care community, I would never allow anyone a TV inside mm -hmm. because it's detrimental to the brain's growth and cells and stimulation. And they, by habit, will just sit there and stare. Right. And, and, and they're in a stupor. And that's the worst thing that you mm -hmm. can possibly do for them. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, that would be, that's how I would evaluate a care community in some, some respects. So, um, yeah, I, I do think that those are, are great tips. Yeah. David Letterman. Thank you. <laughs> um, another thing, if you are at home, uh, you certainly can give the suggestion. Uh, when somebody is moving into the community, um, we often use the d redirection of, let's try this for a little while. Or your doctor said this would be a good idea for you to come here for a little bit, and then we'll see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And often the authority of a doctor, using the doctor um, reference, they're in a generation that they really do follow what yes. their doctor is recommending. And them thinking that they can try it for a while usually can buy you a little bit more time yes. to keep that engagement going. Yeah. So those are some great tips that you offered. So uh, often um, family members don't always express these feelings out loud or one thing they're is afraid of making the wrong choice. Yes. Yes. And so if you're making a wrong choice in a selecting an assisted living or a memory care community, and one of the things is nobody can love my mom or my loved one as much as I can. How can you possibly give them enough attention? Um, and so I want you to touch on like your experience of mm -hmm. how your family made this choice. But the other side of it, one thing that we have found is Adult children, significant others have one set of criteria, but it, when you ask in an assisted living situation what their criteria is, usually their big things are, I want to remain independent. They think coming to an assisted living community takes away their independence, mm -hmm. and the reality is they regain the independence. They don't have to do laundry. They don't have to cook. They don't have to do the yard work. They get to choose what they want to do or not to do. I don't have any better definition of independence than not being tied to a home property or what you should be doing to keep it up. The other piece that they're interested in is the social opportunity. Who are the other ladies or gentlemen that I can visit with and have a conversation? Play bridge or yes. cribbage or Roma backgammon. Cube. Yeah. Roma Cube is the yeah. thing. Oh, it is? Okay, uh -huh. I didn't know. Okay, yeah. good. good to know. Um, and so they want to have that social engagement with a friend or two to be able to have dinner with somebody. Yes. Being at home, having dinner by yourself every day. Or it, even with your your daughter or son's family, yeah, you know who they don't necessarily. They're not your peers. Well, yeah, and and they don't necessarily. I mean, you, they love their grandchildren, but nobody necessarily wants to hear them arguing about whether they want to eat their peas right. or not. It's disruptive and it's very difficult to process when you're trying to focus on whether you want to eat right. your own peas, right. let alone that this right. is going on. So, so you know what what's interesting about this is that the criteria is very individual, very unique to each individual. And the way that you find out that criteria is to actually ask five or 10 years before this all happens. Mm -hmm. As I, I keep pointing back to that, the talk that we, uh, presentation that we did, because that, that preparation and finding out what your loved one wants versus the onus being on you mm -hmm. as a family member makes a big difference because you're, you're second guessing them or you're again, superimposing your, mm -hmm. what you would want on their lives. Mm -hmm. And that, Honestly, I've watched it happen, and I would say it does not go well. So, um, you know, based on the criteria, so what we did is we did use a referral agency. Mm. I, I don't know why I'm saying we. I used a referral agency. Dad was not part of this yet, uh, and he just said, well, where will we go? And that, then that was his cue, my cue to go, I'll look into it and do some research. Mm -hmm. So I researched about 10 different communities based on what we had talked about in our conversations together uh, you know, he wanted a carport because, you know, cars, we were still driving. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he wanted uh, RN, an RN on staff, a physician, uh, on, access to a physician who could come in and do blood pressure and, mm -hmm. you know, check medications and that kind of thing. So on-site visits. And, you know, I was looking more at, oh, he wanted some, he wanted a defibrillator. And I said, well, 
I know you have moderate congestive heart failure, but why do you want a defibrillator for everyone? And he's like, well, I think every place should have one. And, you know, there's liability issues there. You know, you just didn't want to go there. And so I said, well, I think we can skip that one. Maybe we'll, that won't be at the top of the list, right? So it is a negotiation. Mm -hmm. And and so when when we went through it, I narrowed it down to about three properties. Mm -hmm. And then my brother and his wife came out. And then we all went and visited these. Now, of course, mom loved them all. Your analogy of a docked luxury cruise liner is priceless because she said, well, what's not to like? I mean, no matter what we went to, she's like, let me see if I have the street. And she didn't say it that way, but it was, so they're going to clean my house and they're going to cook my food in a dining room, which is always pretty linens. Right. Very, you know, silverware. It isn't like McDonald's, right. um, you know, and a good meal and not dad's frozen food. And uh, there, there's things to do. And they, almost every community has a hair salon. Mm -hmm. So now you don't have to worry about going out and getting the hair, parking, getting her in, getting her out. Mm -hmm. Just take her down, pick her up two hours later and she's good to go. And that's a really important thing to most women, especially of that generation. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I'm just saying that I would probably feel that way even right now. So <laughs> a hair salon is part of my care community. <laughs> Sign me up. So, so she liked all of them, but dad was really hesitant. He was afraid he was going to make a mistake. And the mistake he was afraid he was going to make is that if he chose a place and it didn't work out for all the reasons that were going on inside his Ted mm -hmm. with his stories, um, then how, where would they go? They, they obviously couldn't go back to moving into mm -hmm. a condo. Uh, and so that went more research and moving and, and everything. And it was just overwhelming because mm -hmm. he was in his 80s by that point. Mm -hmm. And it was just too much. So making sure that, you know, he had really strong, long conversations with the executive director, the marketing director, the sales director mm -hmm. to say what <laughs> lots of good scenarios of, well, if this happens, what will you do? How much will it cost me? And I mean, and he had a chart, you know, he had his own spreadsheet and everything. I mean, for a man in his eighties and he had, oh, it was all handwritten, mm -hmm. by the way, no Excel spreadsheets here, <laughs> not, not at that point. And so it was all about tracking who said what and what the obligations were and what the answers were. So my guess is, is that you probably have some examples of, you know, the finance side of things, which was one of his big concerns of why would I go rent from an apartment from someplace? Right. Well, the finance piece is key because... If you don't know what the options are out there, you're really limiting the discussion. So first things first, um, find out wh what pension, what Social Security, what options might be, what savings might be to be able to cal to qualify for care. Um, and just because you don't think they have money or there might be... Um, Social just social security. There still are some state programs, mm -hmm. um, county services, but that that takes time and to in order to go through the qualifying process. So even if they're in your home now and you're saying that we're getting by just fine, you need to be able to start the process, find the resources to know what communities might even be yes. better for the next level, especially um, if you are going on a. Um, state provided care, um, you're, there is definitely going to be a wait list. So yeah. assisted living or memory care community. Um, when you are, once you have the financial piece figured out, then it's like shopping for a car. There's a big difference between pricing of cars. And if you don't know what you're going at when you walk on the lot, then you can't have an educated conversation exactly. with anybody. Great, great analogy. Let's jump through to the next piece about what do you think is the uh, ensure, how do you really ensure that there's a happy transition? So again, it, to me, it goes back to mindset mm -hmm. um, because the people that we're talking to today are the family members, whether it's a spouse or an adult child. And I, I, I have not figured out yet <laughs> how to not shake someone's shoulders and say, just go for the tour, mm. just see what your options are. But I always hear, oh, she's fine today or he's, right. he's doing well today. And it's like, but tomorrow will be totally mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. because that's the way this game goes. And, and it's, and it's also because it's dementia and Alzheimer's, there's no cure. There's no getting better. You just had a good day, which congratulations. Yeah. That's wonderful. But what if you have 
four weeks of bad mm-hmm. weeks and you've done no touring, what are you going to do with that individual while you're touring, by the way? So while they're in reasonably good shape and can be safe at home, mm-hmm. um, and then that brings up another point that I think we touched on before was visiting uh, when you go to a care community. Mm-hmm. So what's the rule there between assisted living and bringing the loved one versus memory care and bringing a loved one? So how does that work whenever you're making that move? Oh, if you're once you're at the point well, of if you're touring, touring, yeah, we recommend. Um, we are happy to have a loved one come along on a tour for looking at an assisted living um, apartment. We want them to be excited and get a chance to speak to the other residents that are there. Yes. Nothing gives you the vibe of a community like being able to talk to some of the residents, and we certainly welcome that. Um, but we do think that it's best if you are looking at a memory care community to leave the loved one at home. Um, the environment can be unsettling because you don't really know what you're going to get on any given day. Mm -hmm. Um, And many people are in different stages of the progressive um, cognitive decline. So leave the loved one at home for memory care, but definitely bring them along um, for assisted living. Yep. And and so I had someone uh, who was giving me an example of uh, you know, they, they didn't think that the loved one was going to like it at all. This was an assisted living tour. And the, uh, the activities director, you know, because when you do a tour, you, you want to get the family, have the family conversation and have the loved one go ex- experience sure. the community. So the activities director grabbed this gentleman and took him in and everything. And, and the daughter and the granddaughter are concerned and they're, you know, well, I don't know if this is going to be a good match. And the granddaughter taps her mom on the shoulder and says, turn around. And he is laughing yeah. and he's having a grand old time. They're telling stories. And it's like, yeah, he can't do that at your house, can he? Right. You know, or he can't do that at home alone. So I, if you, you have to give it a chance. And, you know, just like you said, you know, if they come in and, and um, they see what it's like. Mm-hmm. And there's no harm in that. No. So I think that's really important. But. I think you have um, some top three for us. We are we are actually moving to the Letterman top three yes. because you know I I, I can't let uh, Lori get away with it, <laughs> and uh, so we're we're just going to make sure I have to make sure that I have the right ones here. So the first tip to a happy transition is to step away from the fear and the guilt to avoid making bad decisions. Most bad decisions are made as a result of fearing that something bad's going to happen, mm-hmm. fearing that you know your loved one won't be loved as much or something will happen at the care community where they aren't taking mm-hmm. as good a care. There's all these fear thoughts. And, and the fastest way to get rid of fear is to actually hit it with knowledge mm-hmm. and, and be able to say proof points show that there's no reason for this mm-hmm. to be fearful. The other emotion is guilt and that guilt about, well, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm supposed to take care of mom. I'm supposed to, do, you are still taking care of them. As somebody who was a family member, I visited two to three times a week and, and I still carried the burden of the financial execution and you're constantly thinking about them. So don't, this, you have a sense of relief that somebody else is taking care of the day to day and you still have the other responsibilities of visiting and, and managing the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're not removing that, but from those two guilt and fear, you make some bad decisions and that results in regret. So we don't want that. Number two. Oh, wait a minute. I have to do the, the Letterman thing. <laughs> and then I, of course I dropped one. So st- number two is do your research and tour some communities before the need arises. It can't hurt to know what's out there. So it's not supposed to come back. How, how does he do that? And yes, I know. I see it. Uh, <laughs> and no, she's helping me out. You know, <laughs> know that all transitions are going to be bumpy. Think about it. Any transition in life is a challenge. So, uh, you know, the, the, the key thing here is to maintain grace, dignity, and respect, and most of all, love. And that requires patience. It requires it, knowledge, it requires research. So when we talk about transition time, for you as a family member, mm-hmm. it's months, right? And if you start it early enough, so I started, my mom and dad were talking to me at, when I was 16. So it was decades for me. Um, seemed a little extreme, but you know, <laughs> welcome to my world. So, so, but, but for you as a family member, it's, it's at least six months. As soon as it starts to occur to you to put your loved one 
in a car and have them tour with you because they're starting to show needs mm -hmm. of, of services of some sort, then that's when you need to um, really start. That's when the transition and the talks and all of that starts mm -hmm. to happen. So it's months for the family members. And for your loved one, it's 30 to 60 days. It starts the day that they move in. And it basically goes and, you know, they acclimate, they get used to they make friends, they have activities, they have mm -hmm. things to look forward to. And if you're moving them a little bit earlier, they're going to remember that you visit, um, that you have joys, moments of joy, joyful times, fun things. Keep your visits fun. This is not about updating them on politics, religion, mm -hmm. the kids' soccer games. They don't remember. And honestly, I hate to say it this way, but it's not as important to them as a moment with you laughing, planting a, a seed in the garden, looking at flowers, playing music, doing those, those little things that give them joy. Mm -hmm. It's about them. So, you know, speaking of which, I just want to make sure that everyone's clear when you're visiting. When this transition starts to happen, um, we don't want you visiting every single day, all day long. And I remember I would come to visit and there was this one gentleman there. And I said, what time did you get here? He's like, well, I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with her. And I said, you know, and she was, she was late stage Alzheimer's. So she didn't really even know who he was. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, well, so you've given up golf. You've given up hanging out with the buddies. Do you, is that what she would have wanted for you? And he's like, well, no. No, but I, I feel guilty. I feel badly. And I said, would she have wanted you to feel that way too? And he's like, well, no. And I said, so maybe the best service you can give her is to go live your life. That's not to say you're not mm -hmm. going to visit, but visiting, you know, either a section of day, you know, on uh, three or four times a week, but you have to learn to separate yourself mm -hmm. and stand back. Hardest thing to do on the planet potentially, but it certainly is doable. And they will know that, and you will know that you're doing the right thing based on what they want. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things that uh, about dementia is that it changes people, and it changes who they are and what they like and what they don't like. So, if you go into a care community and you're saying, uh, you know, well, she doesn't like carrots and she doesn't like steak and she doesn't, you know, like bingo and she doesn't know, you know, these types of things, you take that person from how you knew that individual. You could walk in and she's eating all the carrots on her plate. She's eating the <laughs> carrots off of other people's plates because they are totally new people. They literally evolve into different people. Mm -hmm. Not that they've lost their memories of, you know, long-term memory, but it depends on what stage they're at, of course. But what if there was a way as our individuals, as, as, as a, as a uh, country and a world, if we could prevent dementia, if or if we could slow it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I believe that you guys have a, a program about that. So can you elaborate on how we get to that stage in life where we can actually maybe not have this conversation or at least right. have healthier people right. uh, with dementia? Thank you. I would love to. Uh, at the summit at Sunland Springs, we offer a program called the Enhanced Protocol, and it's really identifying the root cause of cognitive decline and then working through different therapies to improve that quality of life. And we have that for residents that live with us at the community. And then we've actually opened an outpatient program in October. It's called the Memory Clinic at the Summit. And that is working with people that live in the outlying area, Mesa, Phoenix area, where they come into our therapy studio. They do brain therapies three times a week. They work with our memory coach. They go through a personalized uh, plan of care, treatment plan, and be able to work through um, what that cognitive decline is caused from. You'd be really surprised in how research has blown up in the world of uh, brain research and how it's not going to be a magic pill. There is no doctor or neurologist that can give you a pill and say, this is going to take this away. But what we've been able to find is that you can do things to improve your brain. And it's not just Sudoku games. 
Um, our brain therapy uh, treatments that we offer are really being able to reinvigorate um, the brain cells, reduce inflammation, increase oxygen supply. So that is something I'd love to be able to offer any of the viewers that have watched the program today um, or watch it in the future is when you see at the end of the screen, there'll be some contact information. Please reply to me and I'd love to have you come to the brain therapy um, studio and be able to experience something for yourself. If you have a cognitive decline in your family genetics and you're concerned about you getting it yourself, we can also give you some tips and some uh, memory assessments complimentary to be able to help you work through that. So the goal really is to be able to head this off. Um, it does not have to be your your genetic code of creating um, just because my grandmother had it, my mom right. had it, does not mean that you're going to get it. A lot of this we have done to ourselves. So right. that is the summit at Sunland Springs, um, the memory clinic at the summit. Um, one more thing that we haven't touched on yet is your book, and yes. it's not that simple. You'll see the copy of my book. I love this book. Um, it's dog-eared. It's written in. It's a page turner. <laughs> um, and there's a quote in here that I wanted to be able to share. Sure. And it's talking about um, your experience of being able to how you were leaving each day while you would go and do your visit yeah. at, the mem um, at the memory care community where your mom was. And you said, I came to the conclusion that I had to reconcile how I felt about leaving each day that you would visit. Yeah. I wondered how I could turn feeling guilty and as if I hadn't spent enough time with mom into being okay with saying goodbye. This is part of self-care, working on how you mind your, how your mind processes the sad events such as leaving so that you don't dread visiting because of the feelings you have when leaving. Yes. So true that it's going to take a while after you have been a caregiver yes. to be able to work through these new emotions because your life has pretty much stopped what it was, right. changed. Identity, identity change. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So the, the aspect of being able to accept and have some grace for yourself mm -hmm. uh, yeah. is, is key as well. The follow-ups that I have with family members after somebody has moved into our community are, I finally got a full night's sleep. Yeah. I didn't have to worry about, did that sound mean she was up? Is that door locked? Um, right. What What is going to be the state of the room um, and the bathroom uh, right. tomorrow? What is it going to bring? I can't take a trip, you know. And now they get you to get your family again. back. You get your yeah, family back. you get you get a lot of different things, and that's actually why I wrote the book is to really focus on this journey, this mm -hmm. complete journey, and give you conversation starters and tips on. You know, how do you say goodbye when you're visiting? And you ne and by the way, quick heads up, never say I'll see you tomorrow or I'll see you on a day. Right. So Wednesday or Saturday or whatever, just say I'll be back. I'll be back. Give them a kiss and then walk away and probably don't turn around uh, because it's more on you, you know, really. Right. And so my mission now, both through the book and through my one-on-one -on -one services with these with family members is to really help remove if if i if i could cross my fingers and wave a magic wand and do all those things that that might make magic happen is to be able to remove any guilt and regret mm -hmm. that can happen during this journey and instead know that you're going to have peace of mind that you did the best you possibly could for your loved one and that they're as happy as they can be and that when that journey ends, all is good. So that really, you know, that's why I started Alzheimer's Family Consulting is to help family members one-on-one, -on -one, read the book. It's the great intro to everything that we've talked about. And, um, you know, I, I, just, I just hope that, that our conversation helps those folks out there. That's fantastic. Thank you, Pam. We do have some of our contact information uh, mm -hmm. that will be coming up on the screen. So if you want to reach out to Pam or myself, please feel free to email us. Uh, check out the website. The YouTube channel for the Summit at Sunland Springs has all of the videos and presentations that I've done with Pam, as well as some others that are on the Enhanced Protocol and what we do at um, the clinic. Um, and we'd love to be able to to help you in any way possible.
I do see that we have a couple different questions. Let's see if we can answer those in the time that we have left. Um, can you address um, spouse versus parents? Yeah. Is it different? Yeah. So uh, in some respects, it is uh, in that uh, when you take vows, you're in a situation where you feel like, well, it's, I said till death do us part. But when death do us part does not mean when someone is cognitively impaired, it, it never meant, yes, you're going to uh, help me help clean me up and clean up my bedroom because I couldn't find the bathroom. Mm -hmm. That was never the intent of to death do us part or for better or for worse. So it's a matter of measuring what that uh, degree of commitment is, but it's not even really about the commitment. It's about being compassionate and knowing that this person never would have wanted you to do that. Right. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with children uh, adult children who are like, mom would never wanted this. My mother never mm -hmm. would have wanted the, to go the way she did. Um, I know almost every daughter in there said, my mom, I don't know what's hold, why she's holding on mm. because it, it just wasn't something, it's not an environment that, um, or a situation that anybody wants to be in. So what else do we have? A couple of follow-up question on that is, uh, does the, the our community take residents with physical issues as well as Alzheimer's and dementia? Yes, we absolutely do. We are a community that is able to care for all different medical needs um, along with cognitive issues um, in our assisted living as well as our memory care. One thing um, just to answer also about the, the speaker's question was really when you have a chance to separate the caregiving from the spouse or the being a son or the daughter, you get to have that relationship back. Yes, absolutely. And the guilt that you might feel when they are, when they might need you the most, really, they don't need you to be able to clean up after them. Right. They need you to want to spend time with them, visiting, sitting, Reading, doing things, being yeah. together. Yeah. But if you have changed your relationship from spouse, daughter to now being just cleaning up the most mundane day after day, you will lose your patience. You will lose your enthusiasm. And that's the thing you get back when you have somebody go into the community, get the care they need. You get to be refreshed and your bucket filled back up. Mm -hmm. We have families that the spouse lives with us and the wife lives at home and they see each other every single day. She comes and gets them and they, they can spend that hour or two hours together. They can have a meal, but it's the proper care for him because he has some more needs than she's able to do. And then when she sees him, she has the energy to be able to pour into him and make it be good quality time, yeah. not just time. And everybody realizes your tension level goes down. Their tension level goes down because yes. they realize, I don't want my wife to have to you know, deal right. with incontinence, right? You know, because this is what happens at times. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is uh, they're not locked in there. In other right. words, the family, family members can take them out for lunch mm -hmm. and, or go do things, go for a ride in the car. I right. know someone had asked me that, you know, do you, are we allowed to take them? And it's like, well, they're not a hostage. Right. Right. <laughs> they're, they're just in a place that where they're going to be safer and happier and people are going to be watching them and stimulating them and, and helping them enjoy their lives right. better, better quality of life. Yeah. 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 Well, and even our, our community, we just installed this camera system called Safely You, and it allows us to see if a resident has fallen and it allows us to get to them quicker. Faster. And mm -hmm. the biggest piece is trying to identify what's creating the fall. So one thing you have to realize, if somebody is on the teetering on the edge and they are having lots of falls, mm -hmm. what is the progression of what happens? The fall, maybe the broken hip, then suddenly they're not safe at home. It is a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. When you have a care community that is built and is intended to be able to care for people that might have some of these higher risk issues, that's what we're, we're um, meant for. 
the final question that came up was um, the summit at Sunland Springs is a rental. It is a 30 day notice. There is no um, buy in condo, $100,000 fee, nothing like that. It is a month to month community. That was a good question. Yeah, great questions. Thank you very much. Okay, without further ado, I think that that covers all the questions that we have. I certainly do appreciate your time. As mentioned, you will get a follow-up email with a recording of this presentation and the handout, Seven Tips to Being Able to Make a Happy Transition to a Senior Care Community. If you would like to purchase Pam's book, it is on Amazon. It's not that simple, Helping Families Navigate the Alzheimer's Journey. It is a page turner. Um, I highly suggest that you pick it up. She's also got a podcast. She's got her website. It's not that simple dot com. com. And uh, again, for from me, thank you so much, Pam, for being able to join us. I love being able to have you here. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you.